Hi everybody and welcome back to our Train the Trainer session on behalf of Looking Glass Education, coming here to you to help you with educating other people around sound money, sound finances and the benefits of Bitcoin. I'm Carolyn Crawford and I'm your host for this series. I'm with a company called F2F Communications and we specialize in business communications training, have done for the last 30 years. If you want more help, in fact, with any of your presentations or training, look me up at f2fcommunications.com.au and I'd be happy to help you as an individual or perhaps your team. But more importantly, let's crack on with our series and let's talk about where we go from here. You've done the biggest, chunkiest part. Well done, congratulations. We did the structuring of your content and that's a big piece to get your head around and it takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of work. So I'm not necessarily expecting that you pick that up and that you're ready to roll in the space of a single video. It will take a little bit of practice, but bear in mind you can practice it in day in and day out conversations. And I'll give you a quick demonstration of that early in this session, just to show you how it works for small conversations as well as larger presentations or training sessions. So let's get stuck into it and let's remind ourselves what we're all about and why we're doing this session, what we're covering in this session. And if you remember, we said there were going to be four videos. The first one was about creating a story of logic that's easy to understand by way of a structure that we'll refresh in a moment. The second one is about how we make the content engaging and interesting for our audience, particularly with what are traditionally considered drier topics, like particularly finance and IT. And of course, Bitcoin is a combination of both. So we'll explore that today. And then in the next video, we'll be looking at how visual aids support us effectively. And then finally, we'll be talking about our personal delivery. Okay, so what's the objective here? The objective of the whole thing, of course, the objective of the entire session is to help us convey some new ideas and sometimes difficult ideas or technical ideas effectively. The problem is that we can't convey anything if people are asleep, um, if they're disengaged, if they're distracted, if they're thinking about other things. So unfortunately, it's beholden upon us to engage, to stimulate, to intrigue, to entertain, to challenge, to make it vary, to make it interesting. And that feels unfair. It feels like, why should I have to become the entertainer? And I'm not suggesting you, you be a professional entertainer, but the fact of the matter is that you are competing against so much other information that's out there in the world. There's so much free information. You get on TikTok, you get on Facebook, you get on, so you're competing against social media for their time and attention. You're competing against mainstream media. You're competing against every other voice in the space. So how are you going to make it interesting enough for them to want to be there, to want to listen? They're so used to bright lights and shiny, shiny and fabulous, fabulous, that if we do something that's too dry and factual, bum -ba -da -da, bum -ba -da -da, bum -ba -da -da, then, it's, it's tough. It's just tough for them as an audience to really grasp what you're saying. So unfortunately, it doesn't mean we've got to change our personality. It doesn't mean we've got to change who we are. If you're introverted, you can still make your content engaging. This is not about becoming a showman. It's about making your content, your material interesting. That's what we're focusing on here. Okay, so let's work out how we're going to do that. And we're going to <clears throat> firstly refresh the structure, and then we're going to cover three areas to help us make the content engaging. So the reason I want to refresh this is, well, obviously, because it might be a while since you've seen the last video, but also because I want to have a look at how this piece fits in with what we did last time. So if you remember last time, we started by actually doing our, our audience 
research before we even put pen to paper. Then we started the planner. And we started, first of all, with the conclusion. We start with the end in mind, the one sentence message, which involves the action plus the benefit to create the conclusion. And we came up with one by adopting Bitcoin, we'll build an economy on hard money, which allows our people and nation true sovereignty and future wealth. Okay, we moved up to step two, the agenda, two, three, four, or maximum of five key headings you want to cover along the way. We did the problem with fiat, how Bitcoin can help, the outcomes we can expect. We then came up with the key takeout points, one per agenda item. <clears throat> the key point around the problem with fiat was corruption and inflation are inevitable. The key point about how Bitcoin can help is that it's hard money, a trustless store of wealth. And finally, we discussed the outcomes we can expect, which is individual and national sovereignty and stability. We copied those headings up twice, the agenda headings up twice, ABC. We went up to the agenda heading up here, ABC, and the top of the big boxes, ABC. And then we copied the three key takeout points up to the one, two, three at the bottom of the big boxes. Okay. Normally this would be step four, but I've left it to this because it's a, as we explained last time, it's a pretty solid piece in its own right. And so I didn't want to include it in the last video. It simply would have made it too long. So we're going to talk about how we populate this data with content and evidence that proves our key takeout point. We want that information, only that information and all of that information that proves that fiat inevitably becomes corrupt and inflated. So how do we do that? Because what typically happens is this. We just put in everything we know without a lot of thought necessarily as to how to make it interesting and varied. We might try to make some, a lot of people put effort into making their visual aids interesting, but not actually thinking about the content itself. How can we make that bit interesting? So this is what we often do, dry facts and figures and data, rinse and repeat. Yeah. <laughs> and what we want to do and what we're going to be exploring in this session is what I call heartbeat moments, bringing it to life, adding highs and lows and interest and variety and bringing heart to it. So it's not just all head level facts and figures. Now, that's going to be tough for some of you. There's a lot of people in the Bitcoin space who are engineers and developers and software and IT. And so obviously, that's the 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 content that's going to, you're going to be drawn to and that you're going to want to talk about. But that may not be the type of content that engages your listener, or that they can relate to. And so that's why I'm exploring this notion of adding more varied styles of content. All right, so to do that, we're going to explore three key concepts. What we call, and I'll explain these as we go, indirect audience involvement, direct audience involvement, and highly direct audience involvement. And we will look at the definition, but also then the benefits and risks of each. And then we'll look at examples for each and how they work in reality. So let's start with indirect audience involvement. And let me just give you a quick definition first. So indirect audience involvement is where we are involving the listeners imagination and brain without, without necessarily asking for their feedback. So if I simply pause, you're having time to think about what I say. That's a form, dare I say, of indirect audience involvement. You're digesting or you're wondering or you're questioning what's going on. If I do a rhetorical question and I say something like, I'm wondering if you've had an experience where a payment got blocked and you didn't know why and your bank had something wrong. Now, I'm not asking you for your involvement, but you're thinking quickly about, yeah, actually, I had a moment where or that happened to a friend of mine or, yeah, whatever it might be. So a rhetorical question is a form of indirect audience involvement, telling a story is a form of indirect audience involvement because when you're telling a story, people are thinking about it, they're suspending their disbelief and they're, they're coming on the journey with you and they're imagining it and they're visualizing it. 
there's another concept, which is an extension of a story, which is what we call hypotheticals. Imagine that you are in a situation where you're a merchant and you're currently paying one and a half percent credit card fees on every single transaction that comes through. Imagine what that is compounded over the course of a year or a lifetime. So it might be something like that. Ima so, th so the key word when you're doing a hypothetical is imagine that you are. Imagine that you are wanting to send money to your family in Bangladesh who are unbanked, or maybe they have a bank account, but there are bugs at the door taking bribes so that you can't even get into the local branch. So imagine you want a peerless payment, uh, sorry, a peer-to-peer -peer trustless payment method. So imagine you are, imagine you're in a situation, you're taking off our hat and you're putting on somebody else's hat. So these are all forms of indirect audience involvement. It's very low risk because nobody has to speak up. They don't feel embarrassed. They don't feel like, do I speak? Am I going to say something stupid? Am I going to say something wrong? So it's very low risk. It doesn't take much time. And it's a great way of varying up your content. So in effect, what we're doing here is we are including what I like to think of as stats and stories, empirical and anecdotal information, head and heart, left and right brain, IQ and EQ. We're appealing to the different parts of the human brain. So on the left brain side of the equation, the empirical data, we've got the business case, we've got the return on investment, the risk analysis, the risk mitigation plan. We've got facts, analyses, breakdowns, options, solutions, recommendations. We've got the cost benefit analysis. We've got our own personal credentials. We've got our timeline, our Gantt chart, our action plans, our research methodology and sources. On the right hand side, which is what we may not give as much consideration to, this is where we want to include examples and similes and metaphors and case studies, stories, hypotheticals we just talked about, big picture concepts and visions. This is where analogies really come in handy. Empathy. We understand some of you may be feeling a bit nervous about this or this may be a bit uncomfortable. It's more personal. This is more personal, the right brain stuff, the EQ stuff. What's the human or the environmental impact? We may not have stats around that. That would be left brain. Great if we can include those. But there may be some anecdotal stuff as well. Is there a little bit of personal expression you want to bring to it? The thing I find most exciting about this or the thing that concerns me about this. Or you can flip that around um, and preempt their concerns. Some of you may be thinking. Some of you may be worried about. Some of you may have the question. Blah, blah. My cat's just jumped up on the desk. And finally, any testimonials you may want to bring. That would be a form of EQ and personal. So we want to vary this data, give conscious consideration, deliberately bring in elements of both left brain and right brain in order, let's include the head and the heart, in order to engage the whole human being in front of you and the different types of human being in front of you. Okay, let's kick on. Let's talk about direct audience involvement. This is clearly where we start asking for input from the group. So this is an in-between, indirect and highly direct, as you can see. And the thing about direct audience involvement is this may be a kind of group, a question to the group, a question to the group. You can choose to get involved or not as a participant. I can speak or I can hide. I can stay quiet. I don't have to get involved, but I can, which is going to be different from highly direct audience involvement. So direct audience involvement is where we explore, where we might do a brainstorm with the group and get it up on the flip chart or the whiteboard. Yeah, that kind of thing. So what are we considering here? We need to plan this stuff. We need to consider how do I phrase the question in such a way that it elicits the kind of response that I want? So we've got here like a variation on a very simple question, which is what do you think the problems are? Now, the way I phrase this 
will get, and you might ask this in two or three different ways to get different angles on the same question. What do you think the problems are in general is different from what do you think the top three problems are? And we, we're expected to prioritize. If you could wave a magic wand, what is the one thing you would want to change? What do you think the problems are in relation to cost? Now we're really directing them down a particular path. What do you think the problems are setting costs aside? The other issues. So the, the potential risks, I'll just explain this for a moment. The potential risks with direct audience involvement are what I consider to be no answer, wrong answer, or long answer. So no answer, what happens if nobody gets involved? That's okay. First time round, if that happens, just turn it into a rhetorical question, have some answers up your sleeve and answer it yourself and move on. If it happens again the second or third time you try to involve them, you may have to say, and you can do it in a very warm and a very kind and a very gentle way, guys, I really want your input. I'm going to start asking individuals because because your feedback is important. This means nothing if I'm just telling you this is this is all up to you to put into play and to explore for yourselves. So you can gently probe them. And then if you need to, you might move down the track of what we call highly direct, which is where you then turn to a particular person and go, Joe, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. So no answer. That's one risk. Wrong answer. Now, this may be accidental wrong answer, in which case you can go, yeah, it's an interesting thought. I don't think it's quite what we're looking for because what I'd really like to, and now you may need to be more specific with the answer to the question, uh, with, the, with the way you ask the question, I should say, because maybe you haven't asked it in such a way that they fully understood what you're after. So now try and reword it, yeah? And then there's the possibility, oh, there's the possibility also with wrong answer that they do it deliberately because they're being a bit of a... a smart ass they're being a bit tricky or difficult or hostile and they're trying to derail you if that's the case you need to take them seriously and try to probe help me understand what are you thinking behind that what's your concern around this just try and get a little bit deeper and get to know the person and what their real issue is answer it seriously of course never be rude back take it as if they are being serious and if need be you might need to either have a chat with them during a break and go hey sensing that you're not particularly thrilled about being here is there something going on for you if you a bit you know is this not relevant for you in some way or you might in the next next time they do it go hey is this not comfortable for you is there a is there an issue here? Is there something that you're not feeling right about here? And try and explore it gently in the group environment. Finally, you might get a very long-winded answer, and that can happen, of course. So with a long-winded answer, that's what I'm giving you here, <laughs> but you haven't got the chance to cut me off. Uh, with a long-winded answer where somebody really gets on a roll, you might say something like, when they pause, go, hang on, let me just grab what you're saying are you fundamentally saying this and see if you can just paraphrase what they're saying and move the session on and go look I think it's a really good thought what you're really saying is this and use your time as an issue just go look I'm conscious of time uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about this but I think what you're saying is this yeah and then just move the session on to the next thing all right great so those are the risks of direct audience involvement it also simply takes up time yeah. So rather than indirect audience involvement, once you start doing a brainstorm or asking for feedback, it takes up time. You're going to have to account for that when you're planning out the session in the first place. OK, but the powerful thing about direct audience involvement is that the more they're involved, more the more they own the content and the message. It's not just you telling, it's them coming up with it. They're coming up with their own answers. Okay, let's move on to highly direct audience involvement. Now, highly direct is different from direct in as much as they can't get out of it. They can't stay silent. They can't do nothing. They have to be involved. So we have to be a little bit careful about how we do it, when we do it, why we do it. It might be 
using an individual name. Let's look at some examples in a moment, but it might be going to an individual and saying, hey, Joe, what do you think of this? Uh, clearly, Joe now feels put on the spot, so you better have built up some rapport and some trust before you aim to bring in highly direct involvement. There needs to be some warm-up before you jump to this. Okay, or most of the time. I I'm not saying that's an absolute rule, but it would be a rule of thumb. Okay, some examples of highly direct, and this is where it really, this is the stuff, this is the stuff of training sessions. There are individual exercises, partner exercises, small group exercises, and whole group exercises. Individual exercises, they may have to each write down something and then read it out to the group. Not easy for them to get out of that one, yeah? So written exercises, read out to the group, or maybe there's some sort of demonstration to the group where you ask someone for a specific example or you ask everyone, this whole idea of round the room is really useful for highly direct. It really blows out your time, but it's very useful in terms of making sure everyone's engaged. All right, partners is where you might turn to your partner, the person next to you or your neighbor and have a little conversation about something. Guys, just discuss this issue. Or maybe they do a little debate between them or a role play of one, of some sort. So one of them might play an innocent victim at the barbecue. <laughs> And the other one is the orange pillar and you're practicing your spiel, as it were. Um, small groups, similar sort of thing to the role play, but now maybe you've got a third person in the conversation and that person is observing the role play, the interaction and giving feedback at the end of it. Uh, there may be brainstorms for small groups on a flip chart that they then have to present back to the group as a whole. Uh, so small group presentations, small group brainstorms and, and presentations. Uh, you can do that online as well because you've got breakout rooms online and you've got whiteboards online. I quite often just put in when I'm doing training online, just a blank PowerPoint. And as they're speaking, I'll just quickly type it up as I go. So it actually becomes part of the full PowerPoint slide pack that I forward to them later. So that's one way of going about it. Uh, quizzes, games, puzzles, competitions, all of these are, of course, your traditional training tools. Keep them relevant, keep them pointed, make sure there is a point you want to take out from each exercise that you do. It's really well thought through. And then there's whole of group stuff where you're getting consensus or decisions and action plans going forward and we need to pull it all together. And again, going around the room to get everybody's input on that. So higher risk, um, can more easily get out of hand if you've got three or four or five small groups around a room in a live session and you're having to go around and keep each one on track and give input and guide them and support them and answer questions as you go. It's a trickier, it's a trickier thing to do. But, but if you've planned it well in advance and you tell them up front, you set up the ground rules for how it's work, how long you're going to give them, what's expected from them, write up the instructions so they can check it on the whiteboard in front of them and refer back to it. Yeah, all of that helps to bring highly direct audience involvement or to keep it on track to get to the outcome you want and to get to the point that you want. So because it's kinesthetic, it's not just oral, it's not just visual, it's kinesthetic. This is the most powerful tool not only for impact, but also then for retention and for people being able to actually implement and use these tools going forward. Okay, so we've talked about indirect, direct and highly direct audience involvement as ways of adding variety and interest to that chunky bit of your training session or your presentation, indirect audience involvement requires that you use head and heart, left and right brain, IQ and EQ information to vary the style of the data. Direct audience involvement involves them much more so that they own the content and the message. And finally, your highly direct is your most powerful tool for impact and retention, but also your highest risk. So bottom line in relation to 
you putting your data together, your content together, your evidence together, together, the bulk of your presentation or your training session, as it were, is that people ask me, how do I make it engaging? And they think it's going to be about delivery. I have to be more rah-rah in my delivery. It's not that. An engaging session is the natural consequence of planning, engaging content. So we've done it. We've made our way through the whole structure now. We've done the big picture structure. We've done the uh, agenda. Sorry, where are we? One sentence message, agenda, key takeout points, content, and smart start. We've done all five. And what we're going to explore next is having come up with that theoretically on paper or on in a Word document or in PowerPoint, but really just as kind of a mishmash of bullet points, we now want to think about how we create visual aids that are going to be really effective in helping us to convey that content. Uh, I will really look forward to seeing you in that video. I hope you're enjoying the series. Shoot through some feedback if you get a chance. I'd be keen to hear how you're going with implementing these ideas in your life. All the best till then. Cheers.